We've got four speakers today, or well, four presentations, five speakers, and then following that we'll have a panel session. So save up all, all your questions and we've got a good half an hour slot to answer all your questions around the presentations today. We're going to start today with Brendan. Brendan Donnell has close to 20 years experience as a structural engineer and currently works for Structure Design in Auckland, where his focus is multi-storey building design. In 2016, he volunteered to join the Executive Committee for Engineers for Social Responsibility and currently serves as the President. The Engineers for Social Responsibility members have been active advocates in the area of sustainable development and climate change in the last 30 years. In November 2020, the ESR partnered with the Global Association for Transition Engineering and the Sustainability Society to deliver a nationwide conference focusing on the emerging field of transition engineering, and this is what he'll be talking to us about today. Thank you, Brendan. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks, Charlotte, for your introduction. Uh, you'll see from my rather long-winded paper title here um, that I've opted to approach the topic of sustainability and the structural engineer through the lens of, uh, as Charlotte said, an emerging field called transition engineering. Let's set the scene by reflecting on structural engineering transitions that we've made in the past. Uh, there's a whole bunch of earthquakes here, um, starting in, oopsie, wrong button. Starting with Wairarapa, where we uh, changed from masonry construction to timber in some places. Uh, we had Napier, we learnt some things. Um, in the 60s and 70s, uh, we did some great research that kept us improving uh, before the uh, Canterbury earthquakes hit. Um, so earthquakes have changed our trajectory in each generation, but not just earthquakes. Uh, let's overlay some milestones in our industrialisation. Uh, in 1791, uh, prospectors reached New Zealand in their search for hydrocarbon fuel to keep the lights on over in Europe. Uh, our first dairy factory sprang up in the 1880s, and by about 1910, we were building Grafton Bridge with our own cement, and then starting to import cars to drive over it. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, New Zealand Steel overtook the dairy factories as our biggest coal user. But this year, the Zero Carbon Act comes into force and sets a target of zero emissions, by net emissions by 2050. And this represents, uh, what I'm trying to illustrate, is it's a, a bigger transition, uh, a bigger change in our engineering trajectory than we've experienced in many generations right back to the Industrial Revolution probably. So to get some insight into this change, we're going to look uh, at the field of transition engineering, uh, how it defines the problem, how it evaluates solutions, uh, and develops practical projects. Uh, we'll touch on some regulatory changes and uh, then draw some implications for structural engineering. And at this point, I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Professor Susan Crumdike, who literally wrote the book on transition engineering, and uh, Professor Thomas Nietzert. And Aroha mai, I'm going to be uh, rattling through it pretty fast to try and stay on time for the others who follow. Uh, so what is transition engineering? Well, it's uh, engineering because it uses art and science to do something practical. Uh, the word transition is talking about a move away from any kind of unsustainable activity, but so far they've tended to focus on the global problem of climate change. Uh, it's really talking about energy transition uh, as we move away from fossil fuels. So, how does transition engineering define the energy transition problem? Well, let's start with this risk equation. If we allow two degrees of average temperature increase to happen at the current speed, uh, the climate scientists tell us we've got a 60% chance, sorry, a 60% chance of killing 50% of wild species and uh, threatening 80% of human-made structures on the planet. So this level of warming is seen as a failure limit. And unfortunately, 
All we have to do to uh, achieve this is to keep turning up to work for the next 15 years and doing the same engineering projects that we've done for our whole careers so far. Uh, I've got a bridge analogy here which is a useful way to visualise the problem. Uh, our two degrees failure limit is a bit like a ULS capacity. Uh, I'll get out of the way. Um, that corresponds to 800 gigatons of carbon in the air. And below that, the climate scientists have calculated a safe working limit of 350 ppm. So it took us 160 years to put the first 100 gigatons of carbon in the air, uh, but by 1960 we were getting really good at it, so it only took us 20 years for the next 100 gigatons. Uh, and as of now, uh, well, between 1980 and 2014, uh, we've averaged about 10 gigatons a year and sailed past the 350 ppm safe working limit in about 1990. Um, so as of now, the bridge is noticeably creaking and uh, on current trends, we'll hit the calculated failure limit in 10 to 15 years. So. Uh, the large truck on the right represents the known fossil fuel reserves that we can burn if we want to. Um, the Paris Agreement and New Zealand's Carbon Zero Act are targeting 1.5 degrees of warming, which equates to about 430 ppm and just t tucks in just below the failure limit. So transition engineering adopts a uh, design criteria of 80% reduction in fossil fuel use by 2050 uh, for its engineering projects. And uh, unfortunately, early momentum is important, uh, looking for 45% uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, climate change is a problem that affects every sector of the economy in every country. So to make it manageable, transition engineering breaks the problem down into specific activities that meet human needs in specific locations. Uh, at the moment, 90% um, of the world's energy comes from fossil fuel. That's a little bit lower in New Zealand. And this creates uh, what we call a wicked problem. A wicked problem is one that seems impossible to solve or has no single solution. And this is where we face up to the genuine, genuine reasons why our activity systems resist change. Uh, the status quo works great, but it's not sustainable. But it satisfies our needs, uh, but it's causing a whole lot of harm and we must change it. But we can't change it, and besides, it works great. Um, one key concept in transition engineering is that expecting people to make virtuous consumer choices is not enough to break this cycle. Um, but the good news is that if you can change the technology and infrastructure to something that works great and is sustainable, then human behaviour adapts quickly. So, now that we've defined the problem, uh, it's time to talk about some solutions, except that transition engineers avoid talking about solutions. Why? Well, one reason is observed psychology. As soon as people latch on to a technical solution, like electric vehicles will meet all our mobility needs with zero emissions coming out of the exhaust pipe, they subconsciously switch off, believing the hard work is done. And secondly, it reminds us that uh, wicked problems don't actually have a single solution, just hard decisions about what to change next. Uh, let's go close to home and look at an example of a solution in our own field, uh, timber buildings. We devise a cunning plan for a three-storey block of six housing units. The timber sequesters quite an impressive 120 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, uh, which gives us some budget for um, our concrete foundations to emit 20 tonnes. Uh, and that leaves us a 100 tonne budget left over to uh, spend carbon on the rest of the superstructure. There are a few details to iron out maybe, um, but we've found a carbon neutral solution. Job done, let's just go home. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the building also has lights, heaters, ovens, creating operational emissions, and the building's not a permanent carbon sink, so when you demolish it, and put it in a landfill, it's going to start to decompose. So the timber building has actually only achieved a 15 to 20% benefit over business as usual. 
uh, which is a long way short of our 80% target. Uh, the timber structure is a really significant step forward, and we'll hear more about that later. But, and it might be our part of the equation, but we just need to keep in mind that there'll be a whole bunch of other people who need to be reorganising and doing their jobs around us to, to get us across the line. Uh, transition engineering also insists that you quantify all these things uh, to test the options about whether they can deliver what your PR spin tells you they can before um, you roll them out. And they've got a wide range of calculation tools available to do that. So let's just look at one of those assessment tools. The concept of energy return on energy invested, or EROI. So to calculate EROI, you take, oops, you take the energy delivered from a system and divide by the energy you spent to generate that energy. Uh, the concept originated from the study of fish migration, uh, which found that for all the energy the fish invested in swimming up waterfalls, they got four times as much energy back by accessing a richer variety of food sources. So the ERO EROI from migration was a factor of four. Uh, so how much energy return on investment do we need for society to prosper? Uh, well, with an EROI of two, we can extract, refine, and transport our energy. Uh, with five, we can also eat, and with 10, we can go to school, but if we want healthcare and the arts, we need an EROI closer to 15. So what does that mean for our economy? Well, we can use EROI to illustrate three different visions of the future. This is our economy now. Uh, let's define our current energy use as being 100 units of power, um, uh, which we're gener generating at an average EROI of 25. Uh, that means we lose 4% in generation, and we have 96 units to spare. Uh, we spend 30 units on primary production, so that's like food to eat, and on maintenance and replacement of our built environment. And that leaves 66% to use on consumption. So uh, let's look for a greener option. Uh, you'd think that changing to 100% renewables uh, would be solving the problem. But uh, without fossil fuels, we can only achieve an average EROI of about 3.7. So if we keep production and consumption, uh, food uh, the same, uh, we've got no energy left for replacement of our built environment at the end of its life. So you'd probably have to negotiate some sort of compromise between maintenance and consumption there. Uh, so the transition engineers suggest we consider a third option. Scale back our energy supply by 70%, uh, just using the best quality renewable resources with a bit of fossil fuel to achieve our target EROI of 15 uh, you've got enough energy for food and to replace your built environment. The key point here is the argument that phasing out fossil fuels is likely to involve a significant reduction in energy and material supply. Uh, so, if there are changes to make, we're going to need some practical projects to make them happen. Uh, transition engineering calls these shift projects because they result in a downshift in fossil energy use. They address specific human activities in specific locations for example, uh, personal transport in Hamilton. Um, shift projects tend to involve the regeneration of an existing system. And to come up with shift projects, Professor Crumdike has developed the Interdisciplinary Transition, Innovation, Management and Engineering Framework, uh, also known as the in-time method. So I'll just run through that very briefly. Uh, in-time is a seven-step process. It starts at by looking at how we met our needs 100 years ago without much fossil fuel, then we uh, crunch the data on present trends and brainstorm a range of future scenarios uh, to test out. Uh, next, we're encouraged to envision a, a successful and sustainable, prosperous future, and then backcast the steps we need to get there. Uh, we choose a shift project, or more than one, to reduce fossil fuel use and then work through a delivery plan. And the power of this method is its ability to achieve consensus with a community of non-engineers around what an actual effective shift project is going to be. So that concludes my introduction to transition engineering. 
Um, but another factor influencing uh, change in the coming years is the Building for Climate Change framework that MB recently proposed, and Katie's going to talk more about that next. Um, but just suffice to say that the idea is that we'll need to meet specific embodied carbon and energy efficiency uh, requirements to get a building consent. So uh, we've looked at transition engineering, touched on a regulatory change that's been signalled. Uh, what could that mean for us as structural engineers in the next 10 or 15 years? Uh, well, perhaps there's a clue from fire safety engineering that might offer insight on the future of transition engineering. Uh, the Industrial Revolution created powerful corporations, but workplace safety was pretty non-existent, and politicians were not responding to worker protests. Then, in 1911, a huge fire struck a garment factory in New York, which killed 146 young women and girls, many of whom jumped nine floors into the city street as they became engulfed in flames. Uh, in the aftermath of that, 62 industrial engineers were motivated to form the American Society of Safety Engineering. They set their own design standards, like changing all the factory doors to open outwards without telling, telling their factory managers what they were doing. And before long, the insurance industry made all these new rules compulsory for all factories. Uh, so today, fire safety engineering uh, needs to be considered in the design of all buildings, and in future, carbon emissions will also need to be considered. Uh, so what does that mean for us in future? Embodied carbon assessments might evolve along similar lines to fire engineering, where all of us as structural engineers need to understand the basics, um, but some of us uh, might pursue a personal interest or a financial interest in uh, becoming really skilled at it, uh, while others might prefer to outsource it um, to specialist consultants. But in a few years, I could imagine uh, us needing to submit a coordination statement to council with our building consent, application confirming that the structural design complies with the embodied carbon assessment report. Um, these days a client might need to be convinced to build in timber, um, but within 10 years that might reverse. Um, steel's the most recyclable um, material on the planet, so it seems like we'll need to go back to doing that in New Zealand. Uh, and for concrete I can imagine us giving up using it for footpaths and driveways and saving it for things like water reservoirs and foundations. Uh, so, uh, fossil fuels give us a massive energy return on our investment, and without them we're going to need to live with less energy and less material supply. So that means our existing buildings will become even more valuable resource, so sorry any first home buyers out there. The structural engineers will probably need to continue our involvement with existing buildings beyond the current seismic strengthening regime. Uh, buildings will change in size, layout, location, and make better allowance for materials recovery. So, just to wrap up and reinforce my key points, um, transition engineering adopts the design criteria of 80% reduction in fossil fuel use by 2050. If we want a future of energy prosperity, we'll need to consume less energy and materials, and structural engineering practice will need to evolve, uh, including our scope and our methodology, uh, and ethically as well. So we'll need to maintain our competency and our training. Uh, we'll need to so show leadership um, to influence our clients and our project teams as engineering professionals. And we'll need to show the younger generation that they can build a positive future by becoming structural engineers. Um, if you're interested to learn more about transition engineering, then you can find this list of CPD opportunities in the full paper that's been written. Uh, Ngā mahi kia koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Right, thanks Brendan for kicking our session off today. Uh, I'm now going to invite Katie up. Katie is the Principal Advisor Engineering in the Building System Performance Branch at MB, the central regulator for the building and construction sector in New Zealand. Katie is part of the Building for Climate Change program, leading the technical work to develop projects for the management of embodied carbon in New Zealand. She's a structural engineer by background, a chartered en member of the Institutions of Civil and Structural Engineering in the UK, and CPENG registered in New Zealand, having practiced in both countries for over 15 years before starting her role at MB in 2019. 
Brilliant. Kia ora, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Charlotte. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm here to talk about embodied carbon, the pr uh, proposals and regulation, and the role of increased resilience. Um, I'll just acknowledge uh, my co-author for the paper uh, in the proceedings, Jennifer Critchley. She's since uh, left um, MB, but um, yeah, contributed to this presentation. So I'm just going to quick flag and repeat the slide that I did in the uh, in the previous presentation. Just the the team that I'm within at MB, just so um, people are aware. So we've got the New Zealand construction industry, we've got MB, this huge organisation, three hundred three and a half thousand employees. Building system performance is the that's the central building that's the central regulator for the building sector. Um, about 120 staff. Um, my team, Building Performance and Engineering, is the technical team within that uh, branch. Uh, we look after the building code, and uh, yeah, there's um, I think four four of us in structural engineering. But uh, you know, so the technical staff that look after the building code is about, as I said before, about 20. But that's across all clauses of the building code. So looking after B1, um, you know, geotechnical and structural engineers, um, there's about um, yeah six of us, I'd say. Um, the little plug there for the, uh, the the stats, the nice stats for the industry is from this um, uh, recently launched uh, Shiny Apps. You can scan that QR code and they tell me it will work. And you can go to um, our website where some of the people who aren't in the technical team um, in more kind of the system implementation um, and the more policy side of, of the branch um, have compiled some nice stats about the uh, yeah the building and construction sector, such as that almost... Um, Half of the waste sent to landfill in New Zealand comes from our sector, construction and demolition waste. Anyway, so emissions profile of the building sector. We like to talk about emissions from a building. And if we do that, um, it's quite common to look at it from a life cycle perspective. So here's a nice diagram of the um, life cycle of a building. And, the, and it's essentially it's the stuff that goes into a building. So the stuff that wouldn't be there if we weren't building the building. So first of all, we extract raw materials, we do some manufacturing to it, we turn it into a product. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's the modules, what we call modules A1 to A3, that's the sort of production phase. Um, we shift all that stuff to our building site, that's module A4, transportation. We assemble all that stuff into a building, that's A5. Then we've got a building and then we start using it. Um, so we're on uh, the B, B modules now, so uh, we might, uh, uh, we might maintain that building, repair it, re um, refurbish it, replace bits of it. So all of that stuff is um, emissions, uh, yeah, activity associated with the stuff in the building while we're using it. We also use it, um, and that um, has impacts in the amount of energy and water that we use. And then we get to the end of a building's life, and we knock it down and um, yeah, get rid of it. We might chuck some of it away. We might, hopefully we'll do more of this, we might uh, reuse or recycle some of it. So all of those activities have environmental impacts, and in particular, carbon emissions. And we like to group those emissions into two groups. Um, one is embodied emissions, and that's everything in the blue bit. And then the other one is operational emissions. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how we tend to a common way of uh, splitting up emissions from uh, a building into those two groups. Uh, and the, the embodied emissions, quite often, I sort of call them the hidden emissions because you don't really see them. Um, perhaps it's easier to see or kind of account for operational emissions because it's your it's essentially directly from your energy bills or your water bills from the building. Um, but another way to look at emissions from the building sector is look at it over um, a year. Um, so for any particular year in New Zealand, what are the emissions from the building sector? So that's our annual emissions. So we've got uh, 69 megatons for the whole of New Zealand. Um, about 15% of that comes from the building sector. And then we can further break that down into, um, well, We'll, we'll get to the uh, operational and embodied split here, but the first thing to do is look at what are direct and indirect em emissions. So the first um, low bar, on-site fossil fuel heating, is the, really on the only direct emissions from uh, the building sector in any one year in New Zealand. Um, so that's burning coal in boilers that, for instance, power the University of Canterbury campus, my local example. Um, but if we look at the indirect emissions, that's all of the... the um, the stacks on the, the right-hand bar chart. The, the next um, chart with a little lightning side, that's the energy um, used to power buildings and um, generate electricity. So there's emissions associated with generating that electricity. Um, so they're the, they're the operational emissions. 
The, the top three bars there are embodied emissions. So the emissions associated with materials that are made in New Zealand, uh, the emissions associated with the waste, and then emissions that are associated with materials that are made outside New Zealand and imported into New Zealand. So um, that's the breakdown of embodied and operational emissions. So embodied emissions every year in New Zealand is about half of the emissions associated with the building sector. So what's the government doing about this? So um, we've got a, a whole of government climate change programme driven, of course, by the Zero Carbon Act that was passed in 2019. That act does actually have two parts to it. Um, there's the reducing emissions um, part and then there's the improving resilience part. So in response to uh, reducing emissions, uh, we've got a national emissions reduction plan. Uh, in proving resilience, we first of all have a climate change risk assessment, which came out last year. And then um, in response to that, we'll be producing a national adaptation plan. And the important thing is those two kind of parallel streams at the mitigation side, reducing emissions and the adaptation side, in terms of what the building and construction sector needs to do, the Building for Climate Change programme has been set up to address both mitigation and adaptation um, from, from our sector, from the building and construction sector. So how are we going to do this? Um, focusing on mitigation, uh, we published two frameworks for consultation in 2020, uh, the Transforming Operational Efficiency and the Whole of Life Embodied Carbon Reduction Framework. And I'm going to talk about this one. Uh, whole of Life Embodied Carbon Reduction. Bit of a mouthful. I like to call it WOLEC. I don't think it's going to catch on. Uh, but the headlines, headline of WOLEC uh, in, the, in the framework that was um, published, the proposal was to uh, introduce requirements for new buildings um, that will require initially um, just a, a reporting or mandatory disclosure of embodied carbon. So when you go in with your building consent, you need to say, exactly like Brendan was, was, was um, imagining, um, uh, what, what the embodied carbon of that building is. And then after time, after we've been doing that for a while and we get used to doing that, um, we would have to then meet a cap um, set. So for any new building, you would have to not only declare what the embodied carbon is, but demonstrate that that embodied carbon was less than a um, specified cap. And I spend quite a lot of time trying to tell people that embodied carbon isn't really that hard or difficult or even new and... Um, you can kind of, you know, it's just like calculating the cost of a building, except it's carbon, not, not dollars. And the basic calculation is simple, and I've put it up here, and I, and I use it as the, used it as the basis for the um, objectives of the embodied carbon framework. So when we look at how can we reduce embodied carbon, I like to think about it's essentially reducing these three numbers. So thinking about embodied carbon for all buildings in New Zealand, what are the three things we can do well? First of all, we can start with the, the amount of new building that we're constructing, the number of metres squared that we're building. I call it new building efficiency. It's not a very elegant term, but it's, it's really making the most of our new buildings, making sure they're adequately sized and not larger than they need to be. Or perhaps um, we're looking for alternatives to build new buildings, such as making use of existing buildings if, um, if possible. But if we decide we've got to build a certain amount of new building, um, let's look at how much material we're using to build those numbers of square metres, so the kilograms of material per metre squared, and let's make sure that we're using um, that material really effic eff efficiently, treating it as a finite resource as it is, and again, not using more than we need to. And then, only then do we actually need to start thinking about carbon and, okay, how much carbon are we using, or is being emitted for each kilogram of the material that we're using, um, called the carbon intensity. So the way the, the framework is proposed is really everything we do, all the kind of initiatives that, that we're looking to, to, to push, whether it be carrots or sticks, that they should be aimed at reducing one or all of those three numbers. That's the, that's the goal of the um, embodied carbon framework. So where do we start? So you can break down embodied carbon in buildings. So we did a study from 10 um, non-residential buildings in New Zealand and looked at um, a whole of life. So looking at all of those modules um, just for the embodied carbon, so associated with the stuff, not the operation of the building, the stuff in the building. And we included typical uh, replacement rates for components according to the, the component design life um, that's appropriate for that building intended life, so working out how many times you would expect to replace things. Um, it's important to note this doesn't estimate, um, we haven't here estimated replacements due to seismic damage, because that's a 
probability thing, we just looked at, okay, how much would you um, be replacing things that would just uh, need replacing over everyday kind of wear and tear over its life? So you can see that it's dominated by um, the uh, substructure and superstructure. So that's, um, well, depending on how you see it, it's kind of good news for us because that's what we do. So we've got the power to, uh, to, to kind of look at those things and, and um, yeah, really focus on that material efficiency and we've got a real opportunity to reduce those. Um, but I should also say that internal finishes, um, you'll notice, is also quite a big chunk, near, um, just over a fifth. And, um, yeah, just bear that in mind when we come to talk about resilience. So what are the potential carbon benefits of, of um, yeah, that material efficiency? Um, these, this is a chart from a study. Um, this is quite a way back now, but it's quite a good illustration of... Um, you can see that the total embodied carbon um, before and after um, applying reduction methods, um, which... which um, include they're not just just limited to material efficiency but we can make a um, fair fair guess that they would include um, in improving your material efficiency um, again we can see that the uh, the purple lines dominated by structural components but also the, the difference between the purple and the gray lines the effect of employing um, um, uh, embodied carbon reduction measures the, the, the biggest differences are also found in those um, primary structural elements. So again, that's us. Um, so this is thinking about that material efficiency number, one of the three numbers we need to reduce, remember. Um, again, that's something that structural engineers, us within CSOC, we've got the power and the opportunity to be able to do that. So, but let's talk about seismic resilience because I haven't talked about that yet. Um, this graph's quite a lot to taken there, but um, essentially to say it's looking at the uh, average carbon emissions of repairs after um, seismic events um, for, for different kinds of buildings using different um, lateral systems, um, and one to five is the intensity of events, so five is a, is a bigger earthquake essentially, so unsurprisingly there's more damage and so more embodied carbon associated with repairs um, after a um, more intense seismic event. But you'll notice that green dominates the embodied carbon, and green, that's your interior finishes, your non-structural elements. So that's not stuff that we design as the structural engineer, but the performance of the building determines how much of that, um, how much of those internal finishes, um, uh, internal um, non-structural components need repairing. And so, again, we also... It, um, we, we also have the, in our work, we, we also, um, we've got the opportunity to reduce that as well. And that is, um, so resilience is, is about um, being really material efficient, this, this time being efficient with non-structural materials over the lifetime of a building, and also making sure that the actual building is going to last the, last the um, lifetime as well. Because if we have to demolish a building and build a new one, we're not doing very well on that first number, the new building efficiency. Um, I've termed this in the paper something called carbon risk. So it's, you know, what is the risk of a, of a, not, of a, of a low resilient, not very resilient building um, over its lifetime? What's the risk of the additional carbon emissions that, we're, that are going to be caused because we're going to have to repair that building? Again, this is something that structural engineers are best placed, um, best placed to do and control, and, and we've got the opportunity to do that. So, to conclude, um, resilience, I think, means lower embodied carbon over, over the life cycle. We sometimes got to talk about a trade-off between embodied carbon and resilience. I, I, don't, I don't see that. Um, there could possibly be a trade-off between resilience and material efficiency. Um, use the term sort of lean design in, in um, yeah, some, some places lean design is used and it kind of perhaps conjures up the wrong image, something that's kind of fragile and not resilient. But I would say that more studies are needed to, to determine whether there is a real kind of trade-off there. Perhaps some of the low damage design buildings that we like to talk about, how, how material efficient are they? I, I, I wonder if they're actually quite material, materially efficient anyway. Um, but again, I would say that as structural engineers, um, as members of CSOC, we're, we're really well positioned to uh, control and, um, 
uh, realise the opportunity in reducing embodied carbon in buildings. And in order to do that, we need to consider the, the carbon risk. And I'll just finish by saying, well, the recommendations from the uh, Climate Change Commission that came out uh, just a few months ago recognise this. Um, They've put, it, was a, it was a notable change from their draft advice that came out in February to the final advice that came out um, just a few weeks ago that um, embodied carbon was in there mentioned as a real opportunity and something that the government needs to focus on, which is good because we're doing, that's what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, the three numbers we need to reduce is because we need to reduce that number. That's the product of those three numbers, the total whole of life embodied carbon. That's the number that matters. Uh, we need to... Um, yeah, become more uh, literate in understanding those numbers and quantifying that carbon risk to our clients um, yeah, in a quantitative rather than a qualitative way. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Katie. And I just wanted to point out that some of the research around balancing resilience and um, embodied carbon is going on and we're looking for some example buildings. So if you, if you are designing a structure or just um, finished designing a structure and would like to have, like to look at the embodied carbon around that processes, then please get in contact with myself or Max Stevens at the University of Auckland. So uh, now I'd like to invite Nick and Owen for the presentation. Nick Carmen is a technical director with the built environment sector at Mott McDonald with a strong focus on sustainability and low carbon design brought about by collaboration. He's worked on projects throughout Australasia, the UK, the Middle East and Canada, but his favorite work remains here home in New Zealand. Owen is a senior structural engineer at Mott McDonald, originally hailing from the UK, which is where his interest in low embodied carbon design began through the minimizing energy in construction studies and forums. Um, both also keen brewers in their spare time away from their calculators, which I imagine is not very much time. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. Kia ora team, how are we? Um, while we get our presentation up and running, start with uh, having you help settle a bit. So um, can I get an honest show of hands of who has read some or part of the um, now about a year old I struck the how to calculate and body carbon guidance that's out there free and exists or alternatively the MB uh, proposed framework around that. So show of hands, who's had a read? That's close to half. That's very close to half. That was the decider point for the for the cash. So um, maybe we maybe we'll split it. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> that's very that's really interesting. I I um, I actually had a slightly more pessimistic view on on whether enough might fall in there. But I think you um, lost a bit, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Anyway, hi everyone. So Hello. I'm Nick, and this is Owen. Um, We've got quite a few slides to crack through, so um, I'll get started. Um, you'll notice there's a change in title from, from that that's listed in the abstract in your, and in your books. Um, it's partially because one of the issues in industry at the moment is <coughs> talking openly and honestly about this topic um, on specific projects. So we, we kind of had to steer away from talking specifically about one particular project um, and focus a bit more generally on a couple of different projects that we've worked on and we've had to anonymise those. So you'll have to excuse us for not being able to talk right down into the detail, detail of some of this stuff, but um, we, we could have that discussion with you um, to the side after the session, if you like. Um, so we want to talk a bit more about a couple of, a couple of case studies for a couple of different building types um, for New Zealand practice and New Zealand data and just want to reiterate that we are in a sustainability session. Carbon is not sustainability alone. Our economy sits nested uh, in society, which sits nested in the environment, and carbon is you know, a pretty strong metric that sits across and influences all of those, which I think is why it's such a hot topic at the moment, but you know, we can't forget about biodiversity and, and social and cultural <coughs> outcomes as well. So I just want to preface the talk with that. Um, you've already heard, um, I think, a pretty compelling argument from Brendan about, about why this might be applied um, to your projects as part of an overall climate um, mitigation strategy for our country and indeed um, for the globe. Um, and you've heard from, from Katie about some of the coming legislation that's going to put this on the agenda for people whether they like it or not. Uh, and uh, I think both Brendan and Katie made a case and, and we certainly made the case for engineers being really well placed to lead the conversation um, 
do the quantifying, take a bit of ownership in this space before QSs or PMs or other specialist consultants jump in and try and do it for us and sort of take the reins from us. I think that would be a real missed opportunity and, and not lead to as good outcomes as we could possibly get. Um, we'll touch at the end about some of the tools, free tools that are out there, free guidance, some of which I've already mentioned. Um, so that, that shouldn't feel like a barrier to getting out and doing it. Um, and, and at the end of the day, of all the technical tasks that we're sometimes asked to do as, um, as structural engineer, engineers on projects, this really isn't the most difficult one that you're going to come up against. The difficult bit is communicating this on internally within your team and externally. And we already have to do, as we've heard today, uh, there's already complexities in the communication piece that we have to do as part of our job. So wrapping in this what is a relatively easy technical task into that and um, communicating that on to people is, is the thing we need to get to grips with. Um, we sort of talked about this. I just really like this graphic, so I always put it up in every one of my presentations. I think you can take away the, the meaning of, of what's going on there and um, you know why, why it's something we're going to be on top of. This is what I like to call the, uh, the ski jump uh, trajectory that um, the global economy has to go on. And um, here in New Zealand, we, our built environment might contribute 15%, but globally it's a much higher number. That's why globally this is a, this is a really, um, really big topic. Um, and this is just a, a reminder about the New Zealand regulatory drivers that are in play and that are sort of cascading down now to um, the MB frameworks and things that um, are, are probably not too far away from becoming reality for um, not just for us, but for our clients. So it's a zero carbon amendment act that um, we've got here in New Zealand, so, and, and that's happening around the world. So what does net zero carbon mean for buildings? Um, and so we like to use this graphic to talk about the stuff that's in the building and the um, carbon associated with the energy and activities that go on within the building over its life. And foundations, superstructure, facade, fit out, and your building services are your main components um, as per Katie's graph. And uh, embodied carbon is about 50-50 at the moment, and it's, a, it's going to become a growing slice of the pie as global grids decarbonise as well. Um, this is a different version of the graphic that Katie put up that talks about the life cycle assessment framework and the different stages you have, stages A, B, C, and D. Um, this is straight out of the iStruct D guidance, so um, for, the, for the half of the room that hasn't um, jumped in there and had a look, um, you, you can find that there. I think the main thing to note is that um, structure, su superstructure, foundations, facade and fit out are really directly within, either they're directly on our drawings or in our specifications and thus very much um, attributable um, to us and, and the, the brief that um, we've, we've signed up to and developed with the client, um, or they're, they're quite directly under our influence. Um, the life cycle assessment framework, uh, it talks about apportioning carbon into these different stages to then sum up to a whole of building, whole of life um, carbon value. Um, but I like to think about the business case and the design being right up the front of this. And that's really where the decisions get made about what sets that whole chain in motion after that. So, and that's where we sit. Um, so what, what we can do is we can measure and compare the predicted, um, and uh, like we've heard of in a few cases this morning with modelling and stuff, it's not about exact numbers, it's consistent crudeness. So comparing and contrasting um, the numbers we're getting out from early on in our design right to the end, maybe through to practical completion as well, and not just holding on to that piece of knowledge, but sharing that um, within our teams and with our clients. And so net zero is simply um, minimising the carbon associated with those stages and then at the end, offsetting the residual. Um, a conversation about offsetting is a conversation for probably a different conference and a, and a different day, but um, that's the general principle. So just down at the bottom here, this is, this is the kind of stated aim of a lot of the engineers declare, architects declare, contractors declare statements that, that, are, that people of different organisations and different parts of the world have signed up to, and it's, it's really about communication first up. Um, it's also it's, it's about calculating the numbers and reporting those on, and then it's using that knowledge to um, collectively, no, not solely, but collectively with our project teams, 
um, work towards those, those, the actual outcome, like Katie was talking about, minimising those three numbers so we minimise the final number. And we've been talking about um, taking our, uh, our, our project manager cousin's uh, typical time cost quality triangle and adding another dimension to that, which is carbon. And um, that's been kind of what we're using to encapsulate a different mindset or a shift in mindset when you come to um, thinking about your projects and, and, and measuring and reporting on your projects. And um, it's interesting, we have conversations with people about, oh, but you can't measure carbon very accurately. And we like to challenge back and say, well, how well can you actually measure cost? And how well do you actually measure time or program on a project? Oh, well, yeah, I guess, suppose it's always a bit of an estimate. Yeah, well, that's, that's the important point, right? You, you're doing these comparative crudeness estimates on those metrics at the moment. We can do it for carbon. Let's start doing it. Um, and it, it, it does require collaboration across all the project stakeholders. But um, when, when we're part of doing that, we can bring our design knowledge to it as well, and we can really make it a much more efficient process. I've seen projects where there's an external consultant that gets involved and they start, start suggesting all these <coughs> kind of amazing possibilities that could come into the project, and you're like, well, my ground conditions just don't suit that, or um, my brief from the client is for, you know, 10 minute clear spans and they're not budging, so there's no way we're getting that through, or, you know, uh, there might be sensitive equipment and things, so we're already, already embedded in the project, we know the brief, and we can, from that point, um, identify solutions, identify opportunities. Uh, one thing that's a little bit difficult at the moment is we don't have good, we can't say when we get to a number for a project whether that's necessarily high or low relative to other projects and that's because um, you know, we're still very early on in the ability to report numbers into a public database and so I think that's, that's certainly a part of the MB proposal that, I support, that we support really strongly which is creating that national database so we can start to get a sense of okay, where does business as usual or um, better best, or better good, better best uh, practice, or hopefully not, but bad practice, sit on the carbon scale and start to establish those benchmarks. But in the meantime, um, if you establish your early number and can do better than that over time, that's always going to be a good thing. Um, so I'll just skip over the slide because uh, if you scan the QR code in your abstract you'll, um, and go to the last page, you'll see these written down here, but this is just some suggestions of how you can incorporate this into your own your own practice, so I um, recommend that you do that. And I'm going to hand over to Owen to um, just talk us through a couple of case studies. And um, these, these are very much case studies where we've already engaged early on around these aspects of the project and kind of come up with a brief. We know, what's, we know we're building a building, we know roughly what size of the building is, so that kind of how big's the building kind of ship is kind of on its way and we're, we're now talking about how do we how do we look at the materials and the carbon um, associated with those to, to drive, some, drive some good outcomes? Owen. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, so yeah, so uh, the reason I'm standing up here is that um, I guess I've gone on this uh, embodied carbon literacy journey uh, over the last year or so with, with, with Nick and reading a lot of these um, kind of papers and things on, on embodied carbon. And um, what I'm gonna show is just a, a few case studies and a few of the basics on actually how to measure embodied carbon. So, um, Right at the start is um, really the materials. So um, as engineers, we kind of use timber, steel, uh, reinforced concrete, and they're kind of the staples of the diet that we have. And ultimately, um, buildings boil down to these individual elements that um, you can then quantify. And so the general approach is um, finding your material weight and then uh, multiplying it by the, ma the material carbon factor, which um, I think Katie referred to as a carbon density, perhaps, or carbon intensity factor. Um, so some common ones, um, timber from, uh, from sustainably managed forestry plantations, um, including sequestering, would be a minus one kilogram for every, um, every kilogram you use. Um, steel in the Australasian region would be around 2.8. Um, reinforced concrete, somewhere around the 0.3 mark kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram. Um, things like... Uh, Aluminium are quite high for their um, energy intensive processes and, and glazing too. Um, and the fact that it's kilogram CO2 equivalent means it's including all um, any other um, emissions from other things like methane or other sources which are standardized by, by carbon. 
And so then you can take these um, material factors and put them into components to compare. So for instance, a 10 meter roof beam, uh, you can compare what that would be for timber or steel or reinforced concrete, and you can start to uh, work out the difference between those. Or even in, in panel systems, so not to forget that um, the cladding you put in a building is very important and often a lot of the embodied carbon can be in there too. So you can compare curtain wall or your, your timber stud or metal stud, for instance. Um, and then the next thing to do is lump that all together and work out for your entire building. And just to pick up on what Nick mentioned earlier, that um, you don't need to go to the nth degree or to that many significant figures. And um, a certain amount of crudeness is probably, probably right in this kind of situation. So if you're working out to the nearest um, tens of tons, uh, kilograms CO2, or tons CO2 equivalent uh, for your building, that's kind of about right. Um, and then what you can do is you can start to option near and, and look at other systems. And just a very simple one on the board here is that um, if you hypothetically swapped out a lot of your concrete floor elements and used um, gravity, for instance, CLT panels or whatever, instead you can, you can, you can take out a lot of your embodied carbon. So the, um, <clears throat> the building on the right being around 300 tons CO2 equivalent compared to its concrete and steel um, uh, initial option, you might say. Um, and uh, there's been some talk from both Katie and Nick about how to benchmark, and clearly that's a very important question. Um, on the board at the top right is um, some benchmarking options from uh, Letty. So this is a, a non-New Zealand specific benchmarking system, and it goes from, uh, goes from F all the way up to A++, and it gives you kind of benchmark in terms of kilogram CO2 per, per meter squared and where your, your building might, might rank, and also in terms of the, uh, the usage, so retail, office, whatever the archetype is. And um, kind of as part of these studies I've done with Nick recently, um, we've kind of, out of interest more than anything else, benchmark against this. And you can see that quite straight away you get good uh, colorful graphics that would be good to display in terms of, oh, the building comes out as a B or a C or whatever, and um, how that could be improved and what, how far up the ranking system you could go. Um, but clearly this is another uh, a journey that New Zealand needs to go on to in terms of working out what its benchmarks are and how that's done. So um, Katie had on the board a big pie chart with where all the embodied carbon is for, for a, um, 10 buildings. And that, that's true, but I mean, depending on the archetype and the usage of the building, that can change. And so here are just a few um, different types of buildings and where you might, might expect the embodied carbon to, to lie. So for instance, um, an industrial building, a, a study we did, um, as you'd expect, there's, there's less suspended floors, um, often uh, very efficiently designed structurally, so there's not a huge amount in, or there's a less than you'd expect in, term, in the structure. But a lot of the um, embodied carbon can then be hidden in things like the foundations, ground improvement, um, earthworks, that kind of thing. Um, moving on to, say, a commercial structure, so generally taller and maybe in an urban, in a, a city centre location, uh, larger clear spans for the um, for the fit out for the office usage and um, in this particular study that we find I guess one of the more interesting things was that um, we specifically calculated that there's going to be a 50-50 split between embodied and operational carbon for the lifetime of this structure so um, it was interesting to note that that was actually what came out of our study but generally more embodied carbon per square meter than you expect for an industrial building um, this was a residential building in Auckland, and um, we did quite a detailed study on this one, even to the stage where we used two different tools, um, which came out with two different numbers, as you'd expect. But the point being here is that um, when we um, looked at the splits between the different areas, between structure, um, fit out, and facade, that we still kind of were noticing the same, the same proportions going to each. And um, maybe the point to note here for a residential building, a, a very large chunk in the, in the fit out. So, carpets, elevators, um, um, I don't know, wall claddings, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of energy embodied in there. Um, and um, a little point at the bottom was that, um, just to kind of get your, your eye in, in terms of how much this is, for every um, square meter of that building, which was a 12,000 square meter GFA building, each was equivalent to approximately a return flight to Sydney in terms of uh, the scale of the embodied carbon within that building. Um, I'm going to flick through this pretty quick, but um, 
um, timber, you have a negative number, and you can see that that means that uh, it's a good. Um, it helps you reduce your uh, embodied carbon in your structure. And um, it's fair to include carbon sequestration in when you're measuring in, in A to C, but it's also important to declare that you're assuming this carbon sequestration. So, for instance, um, it needs to be from sustainable plantations. Um, and um, there's also a lot of debate about, about end of life scenarios and then where this might, where carbon then goes once the, the, the building is complete. But safe to say when you're, um, when you're assessing a building over A to C that you need to um, include for sequestration and that negative number. Um, there's also a lot of debate around um, some carbon factors for steel and where the steel comes from. So uh, whether it comes from a blast, um, blast oxygen furnace or an um, electric arc furnace and the, and the difference in these numbers. But it's safe to say, again, it's just designing efficiently, not worrying too much about the actual carbon factor and just making sure that you're using your steel efficiently and keep asking the actual suppliers for their EPDs is, is the most important thing to do. Um, there are some differences between as built and as designed, so you might expect a little bit more in terms of things like uh, site blinding or um, wastage rates to be slightly different from industry averages, but um, we've kind of found in the past that you might add it around 10% on for um, the difference between an as designed and as built structure in terms of embodied carbon. Um, I think it's back to you, Nick. Yeah, we'll do this in about 30 seconds. Um, just to encourage people, if you're wondering where to go to for tools, there's the UK iStruct the UK's iStruct carbon tool. Um, you can manually adjust that to New Zealand carbon factors, but you don't need to because um, E2 LCD have done that for you already. That's a paid subscription service, does a full life cycle assessment. Brands has got a spreadsheet of A1 to A3 factors. It's been out there since 2019. Go to the website, download it, make your own calculation tab at the end, and away you go. <coughs> They've also got a what they call their quick tool. This is the interface for it. <coughs> what you need to do is you go to the material input tab, you import your Revit schedule of materials, you hit calculate, you match one list of materials to the other and, and, and you're actually away. But um, there's some work going on to improve that. And they've got a new tool coming out very soon which is gonna be 15 drop down buttons to high level define a building in terms of its services, facade and structure um, systems. And that'll start to give you you know, these level of crudeness uh, numbers so you can start having conversations with your clients or hopefully your clients are using this already and coming to you um, with, with this knowledge already um, as something they want to talk to you about. So if there's more detail on the paper, scan the QR code, have a read. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Nick and Owen. So finally today we have Jared Keane, and Jared is the technical director at Becker in Christchurch. Uh, as a practicing structural engineer, he's delivered major projects throughout New Zealand, the UK, and the, uh, Europe. He is the current iStruct E New Zealand branch chair and sits on the CSOC management committee and an industry affiliate for Quake Core. He has a particular interest in sustainability and low damage design and has delivered multiple timber projects across New Zealand. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, apparently I've got one and a half minutes left to give this talk, so uh, I don't think I'll quite make that, but I'll go through it uh, as fast as I can, and I might skip over a few, few things, because there's probably going to be some questions. All right, so uh, this is my talk. I'm going to be focused uh, in particular uh, on trying to talk about what I think we should do about all of this, what is an industry we should do, or what on projects we should be doing. And my, my interest in this comes from the Engineers to Clear declaration that iStruct D did uh, in 2019. Uh, there's now over 200 uh, signatories to that. If you're working for a, a major multinational, you're probably on here. Um, I'd note IABC is on this list, which um, you'd have to have good eyesight to read. Uh, CSOC isn't. Uh, and maybe over a beer or a wine afterwards, you should contemplate whether CSOC should be or whether CSOC, CSOC should have its own equivalent declaration. Um, so the name of the game for us is Embodied Carbon, that's where structural engineers come in. And I'm going to uh, talk briefly about some of the societal challenges uh, and focus more on, on industry and project challenges. And where I can, uh, I'm going to talk about what I think some of the solutions might be to this, because I think that's where the real, real interest is for many of us. So as a society, 
Uh, we, we interface as a profession or an industry with the society, mostly in these two ways, regulation and, and through market drivers, and regulation's been talked about quite a lot, so I'm going to skim over that, other than to say we are already starting to see government clients or, or clients reliant on government funding being influenced by some of these documents before they become regulation, but they are starting to set a bar and a direction for, for how a good project looks like. The market drivers, these are, these are a list of a few of the market drivers that are out there. Some of you will recognise some of these. Um, from top to bottom, they're, they're kind of the highest to lowest bar in terms of embodied carbon and thus things that are going to influence us. Uh, the Living Future Zero Carbon is quite a high bar. I don't think there's many buildings that do that, but it's, uh, it's pretty onerous trying to meet that. The New Zealand Net Zero is coming later uh, this year, uh, and that, to my mind, is a, is a, a pretty good target to aim for. It sets, a, it sets a reasonably high embodied carbon bar. Um, but one that I think is achievable for real projects. Um, Green Star, many will be familiar with. Um, it's got reasonably high market penetration, um, but only about 10% of its points are associated with embodied carbon in, in some way, shape or form. So it's not actually going to influence things very much, I don't believe, uh, for our industry. And Neighbours basically does nothing, so don't worry about that one. Um, right, as an industry, and this is where it gets a bit meaty for us, I think the... The biggest challenge in many ways that we have as an industry is this, this fear of uncertainty about doing something new. We are a, an understandably risk averse industry, right? We've, we've had a number of discussions about the things that go wrong in our industry and we need to be addressing these seriously and thoughtfully. But if we are looking to find new ways of going about doing design and new materials and new approaches, we are going to be having to travel down a path less trodden. And we're going to have to find ways to do that safety without making our buildings more dangerous. And we're going to have to acknowledge that we're going that way and, and make sure that we're not putting unnecessary risk costs and things like that into projects. We're going to have to do the numbers, which, which uh, has been discussed, so I'm going to uh, gloss over uh, this. This is the, the information that's available out there. But I am going to put this up, uh, because all of the carbon is a bit hard for my poor brain to understand, um, but I understand dollars because I'm used to them. These are not real numbers, so don't quote these to anyone. The one on the, the, one on the right is just costs that we're used to. You can agree with those or disagree with them. And the, the one in the middle is the carbon uh, costs associated with the material. On the left hand side, all I've done is I've taken those carbon costs, I've changed the carbon to a dollar sign and I've prorouted it to a steel cost, right? Because I think most of us can understand the implications for projects much more meaningfully if you look at the, the numbers on the far side. The concrete number is about twice what it would be in real dollars. And you can imagine the impact on design practice and even more so perhaps on construction site practice if concrete cost twice as much as it currently did. The timber number, if you see the big arrow there, is pointing to the negative sign. If, if timber cost negative dollars, we would have really different buildings, right? We would be putting metre deep timber slabs on every single floor. So that's, that's what it looks like if you design for carbon. And you can imagine the difference in our buildings if you were designing for those numbers. And I, I think this is the, the fake numbers, right? But they, they tell a story and they help explain where buildings might head to as we start going down this path. Uh, this is a, a graph that's been put up before. Again, I find this very, very useful to put in front of design teams and in front of clients because of the enormous, the enormous bar over there that's embodied carbon. Um, in most design teams, operational carbon gets quite a lot of air time, but embodied carbon doesn't. And this helps get it on the table. As an industry, we, we need to talk about what it means for materials for us. I think I'm going to gloss over steel because that's kind of the unloved middle brother in this, uh, in this conversation. Um, but I'm going to talk about concrete and timber. And, and it comes down to a question for concrete. Is concrete that bad? Um, in my, so my personal opinion, if you're looking at embodied carbon, I'm afraid as it stands it is. Um, but we obviously do not just design for embodied carbon. We design for durability, we design for strength, we design for cost, and a whole bunch of other things that mean we're going to be using concrete for a long, long time to come. Importantly also, the concrete industry is not bad. Quite the opposite. The concrete industry is really, really important in this discussion because they are probably the people in this room who have the most influence over how we can make improvements in this space. Uh, and they've been, they've been doing good work in this area. This is information that's been provided by Allied about some of the, the work they've been doing. They've been introducing... Uh, the embodied carbon associated with their materials. Uh, and importantly, going forward, uh, cement replacement uh, is going to be a key, a key part of this, I think. And I think it would be fantastic if in a year's time, uh, representatives of the concrete industry could be up here telling us about the further improvements that are, that are currently happening uh, and that are hopefully, hopefully current, coming to market in the next 12 months or so. Um, I think it would also be very useful if they could 
if they could help engineers to specify cement replacement, so it can be done, it can be done, it's quite effective on projects, really effective actually. You can, you can replace in many situations, perhaps about 30% of your cement by specifying it. Uh, it does have some behavioural changes. It, it leads to uh, shrinkage issues and longer curing times. Um, but I think the concrete industry has got a key part to play to help engineers to specify uh, concrete that is, is better uh, for the environment as part of projects. The flip side to that question, is timber really that good? Um, again, if you're only measuring embodied carbon, well, well, yes, it is quite good. It's got that negative value. Um, however, again, we don't just design for embodied carbon, right? We design for strength and stiffness, and timber's not great for those, and there's a number of things that it can't do. Um, so it's about horses for courses. Also, source matters a lot. You need to be using sustainably sourced timber. If you're not, you're just chopping down native forests, and that would be idiotic, uh, so don't do that. Um, and there's some other challenges that the timber industry, I think, needs to step up on uh, to, to help with the design of, of timber. One of them is standardisation. Um, we have a, a wonderful document uh, around standardisation of, of timber for light framing timber. It helps all sorts of people building timber all over the place. Um, the equivalent documentation, we do not have the equivalent documentation the steel industry has for heavy engineered timber. Um, it does make timber design harder, it does make it more costly, and it is a barrier to using timber on projects, and I think the industry needs to step up to start addressing that. Uh, and timber and fire is something that needs to be discussed as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a hot topic, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, there's also a bit of scaremongering, I think, that's happening around that. Um, my personal view is if you are designing a building that has sleeping accommodation, you need to put some pretty serious thought into whether filling that building with a combustible material is appropriate. Uh, but for a lot of other buildings, for warehouses and offices and things like that, uh, I actually think that the, the current legislation that we have around timber and fire is actually uh, it's one of these risk-averse areas that set an extremely high bar compared to some of the other risks that we're dealing with, uh, such as seismic risk, for instance. Uh, and so I think there's more work that needs to happen there as well. Um, this is one I do not have a solution for. Uh, we have a lot of supply chain issues. Uh, they're generally worse for, um, for more niche products and they're going to be worse for products that are coming under higher demand. And I think these are all products that will come under higher demand. So um, this is going to take some quite concerted effort to deal with. And I think, to be honest, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be with us as we try and design more sustainable buildings uh, for probably the decades to come. Uh, onto, onto projects, and I want to give some, uh, a few brief thoughts about what people can do on individual projects. And basically what you can go tomorrow, well not tomorrow, you should be here tomorrow, but on Wednesday back into the office to, to, to attack on a project immediately. Um, you see uh, Nick and Co have stolen my thunder on this, we've, uh, we've developed this independently I assure you. Um, but, but it's pretty simple. Like, the first thing you need to do about it is talk about it on a project. If you talk about it, you might be able to do something about it. If you don't, you won't. Uh, so I, I draw the analogy actually to safety and design, where it was something that we never quite did until we started talking about it. So you know, on a project, just, just ask the question, do people want to do something about this and see what, where it goes? Um, this here is certainly something that everyone can do. This beautiful building here um, is probably the most sustainable project, at least that I'm aware of, in New Zealand. Um, this is the B201 building at the University of Auckland. Uh, and this is why. So can I ask just a quick show of hands, who has done a strengthening scheme sometime in the past decade? So if you could all just give yourself a pat on the back, because that is the most sustainable thing that you can do as a structural engineer. And it doesn't, it doesn't uh, sound like much necessarily, but actually don't, the don't build it, fix it mentality is not easy if you're a structural engineer in New Zealand and you're trying to strengthen a building that maybe you might like to demolish. But without a doubt, it is the best thing that you can do to reduce embodied carbon for a project. And I think, if we started looking at these strengthening schemes through that different lens, it would make quite a difference. Uh, and we started talking to our clients through the same issue. Um, if you are doing a new build, you are probably going to want to inject a wee bit of sequestration uh, into that project, inject a wee bit of timber. Um, it, it does do a lot for the carbon numbers, uh, pretty much whatever way you cut it. Um, this, is, um, this is the Beatrice Tinsley building at the University of Canterbury under construction, what's well, built now. Um, you might not want to start here. It is, it is quite complicated to design one of these things. Um, if, you, if you can, great, go for it. Um, but you might want to start with something more like this. Um, this is the Waimea College uh, project up near Nelson. Uh, this is my favourite timber project. It's my favourite timber project because it was done in the Ministry of Education budget, uh, and those who have worked on those projects will know they're not overly generous budgets. 
Um, but you can get these sorts of buildings across the line. It's just a simple two-storey timber building with, with nothing particularly fancy going on, but it does have a sympathetic architect and a sympathetic client and a sympathetic QS who were willing to let us go down the path of seeing if we could make it work on the budget and give us enough leeway to get there. Um, you can, of course, start simple. This wonderful stuff here. Um, there's a, I haven't got the numbers, but there were some fantastic numbers put up before about the amount of uh, carbon associated with fit-out, and I'm pretty sure it's not beyond anybody here to uh, design a stud wall. Um, if you get really fancy, you can do your purlins and timber as well, and you can put a bit of plywood on it. Right? This is really easy wind stuff that people can start doing tomorrow. Um, and it doesn't have to be fancy, but it can make a pretty big difference in the final numbers. You can start taking out your, uh, your precast floors and dropping in CLT floors. Pretty much anywhere you've got a precast concrete floor, you could drop one of these in, and it's a, it's a bit of a gateway drug into uh, structural timber. Uh, similar, similar, similar here, um, your lift cores, you know, rather than building block lift cores or the fiddly steel frames that we all do, you can drop a CLT panel. These come in um, kind of up to around, uh, I think it's 15, 18 metre length, something like that. So they're really nice for kind of two, three storey buildings to drop one of these down for your lift core. Really nice to, to fix your lift to. If you are getting into your superstructure, uh, this is my hierarchy of, of where I think you should focus your efforts um, on, on floors first, then your gravity system, and then kind of go to your lateral system at your own peril. Um, there's a range of different floors that you can use um, for, and there are some challenges around floor design. Um, these, these three are the big ones, your, your diaphragms, uh, your, your acoustics and your fire. Your diaphragms mean you're probably going to want to go to a distributed lateral system. Um, so um, you can often change out your entire floor system if you are more thoughtful about your lateral system. Um, that might mean going to say a steel moment frame or something like that. That's, uh, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but that's a typical uh, gravity connection. It's certainly more complicated than writing WP30 on a piece of paper. Uh, but once you've designed a couple of these, you know, you start to build a bit of a library that you can reuse. And they're, they're not that complicated to do. Um, this, which you almost certainly can't see, is a, is a lateral system. This is, this is rocking CLT post-tensioned walls with attenuators at the bottom. Um, there's a lot of work in these, um, and I think you've got, to, you've got to think carefully about going down this path, because this is where Tim gets a bad rap for being expensive, I think. Um, material reduction's been talked about, and this is Structural Engineering 101. Uh, this project here, this is the ANZ Centre in Christchurch. It's one of the first projects I did on my return uh, to New Zealand. I was very, very proud of this at the time. It's a, it's a metre deep concrete slab, <clears throat> um, <laughs> 50 metres by 50 metres. It won a prize for the biggest concrete pour in Christchurch. Um, it, look, I think we've all got projects like this. I, look, it did what I, I sought to do with this, and when I go back and I put a carbon lens on it, it's not very good. Um, and there are different solutions I could have used and would have used if I was thinking about carbon more carefully, and I, I think that is probably true for, for most people. Um, the foundations is often an area where you can get some really good bang for buck here. You know, do, that could have had a ground beam system. Uh, look at rib rafts, look at piled options, they can be more material efficient. Your material reduction is far more impactful for carbon than it is for cost because you don't have the labour component that you're trying to deal with as well. Uh, and finally, uh, cement reduction. The most, the most simple thing you can do on Wednesday is go back and consider what strength concrete you're specifying. All right? If you're speaking 40 MPA concrete and you only need 20 MPA, make the change and it will significantly reduce the amounts of carbon involved. You can also probably replace about 30% 30, 30 of the, um, the cement, especially in things like foundations where you're not so, much, so worried about things like shrinkage, and you can do that tomorrow. Uh, and maybe go talk to your supplier about doing something a wee bit more. Um, and a, bit, a wee bit of a stat, um, if, you took, if you took all of the concrete we produced and you managed to take half of it and reduce its strength by about uh, 15 MPA, you're looking at about half a million tonnes of carbon uh, that you'd save as a result. Uh, and I'm pretty sure everybody here knows how to choose a concrete strength. Uh, so um, finally, what, what do I think success looks like? Ultimately, it's about cumulative embodied carbon reduction. For the, for the structural engineering industry, I think that's what it looks like. And that'll need cumulative action. And ultimately, that's going to need the individuals here and the individuals back at your companies and those organisations and the industry bodies looking at what is within your sphere of influence, what you can actually control and change, and making some positive contributions starting tomorrow on that. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, thank you, all of our speakers. They've done a fantastic job of setting the scene. We, uh, they're all so great, but they've all run over time. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, our question panel's got a little bit short. But, so I'm going to leave my questions, or ones that we had organised, and see if we have any questions from the audience, since we've only got 10 minutes. So, Hamish. Uh, look, fantastic presentation, really enjoyed all of them. Um, but I've got a, a, a question, and maybe it's a dumb question, I'm not sure, so I'm kind of keen if one of you or, or several of you can answer it. Surely if we're talking about whole of life and body carbon calculations, it seems to me that the, the bit that's missing from the presentations that I've seen is the life of the building. And if we can double or even triple or quadruple the life of our buildings, surely that whole of life and body carbon calculation drops significantly. And am I overthinking that or have I got something wrong? Why aren't we just designing buildings to live longer than a 50 year building code minimum? Oh, you mentioned the building code, so I guess I'm... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, um, well, I... Uh, th that first number, I called it like new build efficiency, which is a rubbish name, but it's about it's about making sure that every every square meter of building we design we we create new is is built to last. Um, so yeah, more than 50 years would be ideal. Um, yeah, absolutely. There is a conversation we can have about you know what is the design life of a building. Um, it clearly shouldn't be 50 years, but you know what? How do we? Um, when you design a building, or, yeah, the, the, the code minimum is 50 years, but what does that, you know, how does that affect you as a designer? Um, I think that's, that's a really good conversation to have. But I would say the other thing is um, to think about, yes, we do need to think about the whole of life of a building, but those two graphs I had at the beginning of mine were looking at, okay, let's look at, um, you know, the whole life cycle of a building, and it's so, so many years into a future. Or the other thing we can look at is what are we doing next year or what, what do we do last year, what are we doing this year in terms of how many new buildings we build. And whilst um, I don't want to like contradict myself and say that whole of life isn't important, it is important, but we also need to think about this year, how many new buildings are we building? Um, and uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think you're right, but there is also the issue that we've, th there's a generally agreed kind of limited limited window to get this before it, it, it travels too far. And we're dealing with our current building stock, which has its current design life, right? And it is what it is, and it's probably made worse by the fact that our knowledge has grown and you, you overlay earthquakes on it and some of it may not last out its design life. So we, we, uh, if we designed all of our buildings starting tomorrow for a 200 year design life year, it might, it might make that question kind of moot over the next 200 years, but we're still dealing with our existing building stock and the fact that some of it's going to be demoted and replaced regardless because it was designed in a previous design paradigm. So. One other challenge to point out, one of my favourite sustainability articles came from the States and they calculated that the average uh, life expectancy of a building in America was 35 years and that was because of obsolescence, functional obsolescence or aesthetic obsolescence. So that's another thing we've got to think about. It's not just B2, it's uh, who wants to use the building, what it looks like, is it fit for people to repurpose and use. So great goal, but there's some challenges. I think the short answer is yes <laughs> to, to, to what you suggested there, Hamish. And there's a relationship there to um, the whole building. So, you know, uh, buildings last because people love them and people like to have them part of their built environment and they like interacting with them um, every day. Um, so, you know, that's where we have to work hand in glove with uh, architects, developers and regulators on that. And I'm, I'm sure there's a debate to be had about how we could capture that in a metric, but I think from a, from a philosoph philosophical perspective, yes, longer lasting, um, meaningfully used buildings that displace the need to build more in the future, uh, absolutely something we should, we should all be looking to do, and that includes repurposing our existing building stock as well. All right. John? John? Yeah, um, so a question and a follow-up question. Um, currently, what is the split in terms of being flat? Commercial 
um, you know, people move into an apartment living quite reluctantly, and it's probably this the greatest uh, opportunity for production of carbon for residuals. So, your thoughts on that? I'm holding the mic, so I'll start. Um, it's a good question. I think my, my understanding, and I'm getting a bit outside my remit here, but my understanding is that some of the carbon savings, significant carbon savings that come with, you know, moving to closer to metropolitan centre, medium rise, high rise um, residential living is kind of the ancillary benefits associated with the carbon associated with the infrastructure that has to go in because you're not trying to service houses in Pocono and Milldale and Ari where you, they're sort of more centralised and the associated carbon with you know people getting around to and from their jobs and their place of work but fr from an embodied carbon perspective um, I, I think we're still early on in the journey about um, whether whether from an embodied carbon budget perspective it is um, more efficient to have more three-storey townhouses scattered around some of the city fringe suburbs or more nine to 12 storey apartment buildings um, and heavier structural systems in the CBD. We, we don't have the data set to, to tell that yet, so we need to collectively be inputting into that data set together right now so that we can have some data to work with to try and figure that out. Um, I might just share, I haven't done a lot of, of residential, but I've, done, I've looked at this across a, a lot of kind of low rise commercial, and some of the same rules probably apply. When, you, when you've gone to a low-rise commercial and you've gone to a timber solution and you start looking at what's next, uh, which probably has a, has a similar sort of carbon footprint for some of our residential buildings, one of the best things you can do actually is go to two-storey because often you're, found, you're going to have a very similar foundation system but it's going to be over half the footprint so you've basically chopped half your foundations out um, and though you've, thus you've chopped out half your concrete. Um, but also just using more materially efficient foundations um, you know, I think the superstructure of most of our, our suburban residential uh, dwellings are, are pretty good, actually, from an embodied carbon point of view. Um, they're well ahead of the curve compared to some of the commercial stuff. But the, the substructure is the area I'd focus on. If you do a timber pile with a raised timber floor, then it's looking like a pretty good building from an embodied carbon point of view. I'll just add one small thing then before I move on. Uh, Brands is doing a lot of research in this space and they've published some really fantastic articles about the embodied carbon and the efficiency of our residential housing compared to New Zealand and internationally. They're also looking at how our residential housing model is going to work with the carbon budget to achieve net zero and how that's going to work as a occupancy and per square metre rate. So that'd be... Great. Okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd say um, I guess there's two things there. There's um, new buildings and existing buildings. You know, I only talked about proposals for new buildings, but um, as well as the good news for embodied carbon in the Climate Change Commission's final advice um, that they picked up on that, they also um, emphasise that we need to look at existing buildings, and that's something that. Um, and this building for climate change program is going to take away and do. So I think you're exactly right. We need to think about 
existing buildings as well as new buildings. But your other um, point about uh, the type of buildings, the type of communities that, that um, we live in and, and what kind of lifestyle, the carbon intensity of the lifestyle that, that um, those types of communities allow is also really important. And I guess there's another, there's another part of the, um, uh, there's another framework about operational efficiency, which is how you operate buildings, and we're developing them together. So I'd like to think that we're avoiding the, the um, potential to kind of, tr you, you know, have unintended consequences of increasing one more than the other. But there's even, there's, it's not just embodied carbon and operational carbon of buildings. It's, it's your point about, yeah, the kind of, what the other emissions that go around associated with the, the, the living around that building, not just in the building, is also something that, yeah, you're right, we do need to think about. Been giving very strict instructions to finish at five. Is there any last questions? Yes, yes, one more. Uh, there was a slide regarding uh, carbon cost of the materials. Um, I think one, uh, I think steel carbon cost was eight dollars per kilogram, which to me is definitely is not realistic that that cost. I just wonder how that calculated. And, and just last point. Um, here I see about to release carbon calculator and announce uh, carbon offset program. So for, uh, in that program, uh, there is opportunity to still uh, to design steel and uh, pay for carbon offset. I think um, the maximum cost for neutral carbon is um, few percent. I think two percent. 2% additional construction cost. So that $8 per kilogram was, uh, I don't know how, how, how uh, So I'll, I'll repeat, they were made up numbers. <laughs> so the, the, the point of that slide is do not pay attention to those numbers. Um, that when you try and quantify things for, because it's, it's about embodied carbon, if you just report kgs of carbon, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. Right, it's a, you throw around a million numbers and nobody knows what they're talking about. The point of that slide is that if you convert it back to dollars, concrete becomes significantly more expensive and timber becomes a negative value. And steel is somewhere in the middle. Um, that's, that's what I was aiming to convey there. So again, do not use those numbers. They are not correct. <laughs> yeah, for comparison over there. Okay, uh, I'd like you all to join me thanking our speakers today and our panel. And just to add that, stealing words from the conference, you know, we are at the point of a new beginning here and I'm glad that you're all in our tent together talking about sustainability and hope you take this knowledge back with you. The papers that these guys have written are really, really good and definitely worth a read and have fantastic resources to help point you in your learning around sustainable design. Thanks, I'll see you at the dinner soon.